In today's red and blue political roundup, the president's nominee for attorney general stood his ground Tuesday, asserting he won't be bullied by anyone. William Barr testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee. He tried to assure lawmakers he would not interfere with the Russia investigation or be at the president's mercy. I will not be bullied into doing anything I think is wrong by anybody, whether it be editorial boards or Congress or the president. I'm going to do what I think is right. Barr said his independence compelled him to accept the nomination, adding that he did not seek out the position. He said he felt he could be a leader during a time when our country is, quote, deeply divided. Let's bring in Zeke Miller. He's a CBSN political contributor and a White House reporter for the Associated Press. Well, Zeke, Barr suggested the special counsel's final report might not be released. I want to play a, a little bit of what he had to say. The rules, I think, say that the independent, uh, the, the special counsel will uh, prepare a summary report on any prosecutive or uh, declination decisions and that that shall be confidential. All I can say right now is my goal and intent is to get as much information out as I can Thank consistent you. with the regulations. Well, Zeke, besides the sound of everyone's jaw hitting the ground, how did Capitol Hill respond to that? You know, by and large, Barr's uh, testimony was, was, was fairly well received, even by some Democrats on the committee. It was a lot lower energy, a lot lower drama than we've seen some of these confirmation battles. And that's partly because Barr has done that job before, partly because he was apparently well prepped. But when it came to some of those key questions about the Russia probe, he, you know, Barr came in there with the message of essentially trying to reassure the committee, you know, Democrats and Republicans, that he was not going to interfere in that investigation. And then when it comes to the, that, that critical question of what would be made public after uh, the <coughs> special counsel Robert Mueller finishes up, which is expected in the next, uh, couple, uh, in the next couple of months, uh, what, 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 what would that look like? And there, there's, there's certainly some concern uh, from Democrats on that, but Republicans seem to broadly, and they're the majority, they seem to be broadly satisfied with the, the answers that they heard today. And it seems that uh, the big question is not whether Barr will be confirmed, but whether he'll, he's going to recuse himself from the Mueller probe due to his criticism of it. Where does that question stand now? Um, it, it, where it stands right now is it doesn't appear that Barr will do so. Um, he'll certainly uh, committed to, be, to talk to the Justice Department's Career Ethics Council, but uh, that is the sort of thing that has not been determinative in the past. Matt Whitaker, who's the acting attorney general right now, was told by Ethics Council at the, um, at the Department of Justice to, uh, that they, they advised him to recuse himself, and he decided not to go along with that. So uh, it's not necessarily, necessarily that Barr would do so, and certainly when the president did, did pick uh, uh, William Barr was with the expectation that he would not recuse himself from that probe. So it's, it's, it seems to be highly unlikely that that would happen. Senator Lindsey Graham is, is leading this committee, and he sometimes is good cop, bad cop uh, with President Trump. But how, how is his leadership impacting this process? You know, from the first couple of questions uh, from Lindsey Graham, we heard him sort of go, go to some of the, the uh, sort of uh, what, you, what you might call sort of conservative talking points about the Department of Justice and and and, and its actions over the past several years. Uh, it was kind of a striking to hear that from Lindsey Graham, who was uh, certainly a few years ago had been viewed as a uh, sort of more uh, bipartisan broker on Capitol Hill and an, an occasional <laughs> critic of President Donald Trump. Certainly ran against him in 2016, uh, but what we've seen from from Graham over the last several months is he's is cozied up with the White House, uh, and now in this case, sort of asking bar questions that were uh, that, that were meant to sort of distract a little bit from what everyone else seemed to be there to talk about, uh, does sort of indicate you know, Graham is in cycle this year. He's up for uh, re-election in 2020 mm -hmm. in South Carolina, conservative state. He had a tough go around last time. Uh, that you know he, he's has you know no politicians can be removed from their own per personal politics, and that seems to be a bit of where Graham is uh, today. You mentioned Whitaker, the acting attorney general, Matthew Whitaker, agreed on Tuesday to appear in, in front of the Congress next month. It'll be the first congressional oversight hearing of, of this term. What are Democrats looking to get out of it? Well, they're looking to find out you know, why Whitaker decided not to recuse himself, whereas Depart Department of Justice career attorneys had advised him to do so. They want to know what actions he has or may be willing or have, has already taken when it comes to the, the, to the Mueller probe. Has he not approved any requests or, or approved some other uh, requests? Has he done anything to the budget or anything along those lines, said anything, sent any internal guidance about uh, that probe or interfered with it in any way? Um, that's the Russia part of it. And then there's this whole other 
uh, sort of uh, question, all these other questions about the Department of Justice uh, that the, the acting attorney general is, is involved with. Some of the, the concerns raised of even over the past 24 hours that lawmakers want to know more about is the Department of Justice's ongoing review of uh, rules when it comes to, to uh, potentially prosecuting journalists and imprisoning journalists in, in, uh, in, in criminal investigation. That's been an ongoing decades long fight within Washington. So uh, there are a whole host of questions that, that uh, lawmakers want to hear from the attorney, acting attorney general. But obviously those Russia questions will be front and center uh, come February 8th. And of course, Zeke, all of this is happening with the backdrop of the longest government shutdown in history. Congress is reportedly preparing to cancel next week re next week's recess if this drags on. But is that something, canceling a recess, is that going to force lawmakers to actually do anything, canceling their recess? It's certainly going to hurt uh, some of them. You know, they, they, a lot of them have family back home, friends back home, constituents back home. They have commitments that they are potentially going to have to have to pull out of. Uh, but you know, broadly, you know, lawmakers are you know. You know, as a rule, are popular in their districts, while the rest of Congress isn't. Um, it's not going to hurt them. All, uh, it might be, it, it'd be an inconvenience, but not a, a, a political liability for them. It'd be worse if they had gone home and appeared not to be working or vacationing or doing uh, business back in their home districts rather than in Washington dealing with the shutdown. But it's not clear being in Washington is going to change anything. There are no talks, really substantive talks, going on between either side, and no. Uh, off ramp from this stalemate. So being in Washington isn't, you know, we, we shouldn't be expecting a big kumbaya moment um, here next week uh, if they do indeed uh, decide not to go home. At the local level, and when I say local, I mean DC, what immediate pain is Congress feeling? I mean, you have staffers there who are young. Uh, I mean, are they getting paid? Can they go down and grab coffee from the Cannon basement in the cafeteria there? What, what are they feeling on Capitol Hill? On Capitol Hill, they're not really feeling a whole bunch of the pain at all. Congress is one of those uh, is one of the is one of the uh, the federal agencies that Congress decided to fund. Uh, they they they, they uh, they've dealt with uh, they're one of the appropriations bills that have already been dealt with. On the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue at the White House, it's a very different story entirely. Hundreds of employees are furloughed. Uh, senior staffers, uh, I've been talking to a few of them over the last couple of days, are you know having to learn how to print and run photocopies and uh, fetch their own coffee and uh, you know manage their own calendars where they normally have assistants and other. Uh, folks who do that for them. Uh, there are other, you know, cr certainly more substantive uh, areas, uh, people in policy areas that are not deemed critical who are furloughed. But uh, they're, they're, they're feeling the pain on, on that side of Pennsylvania Avenue, not so much over at the Capitol. And we want to talk about the shutdown, of course, when we're mentioning the shutdown, we always talk about the president. He seems to have like a Twitter press conference. Uh, sometimes every morning his message is taking up a lot of the conversation that's in the headlines. Is, is all that attention helping or hurting his odds of getting what he wants at this point from House Democrats? At this point, it's really not clear how the president is going to get what he wants. Uh, you know, even Republicans aren't too, too keen, have never really been keen on the wall, and they've been sending mixed messages to the White House to try to find a way out of it. Uh, the president's uh, Twitter messages, like so often we've seen over the last several years, aren't really designed to sort of reach over, reach across the aisle. He's certainly not. You know, he's telling Democrats to come back to work, but it's not. You know, it's more of a, it's not an, an honest offer in a lot of ways. It's a uh, it's a political to cudgel that he's using really to activate his own political base. Uh, the president is often we find talking to a uh, to a large but not a majority of the electorate, uh, the vo those who voted for him in 2016, who he wants to have vote for him in 20 once again. And uh, that's, you know, the, it often appears to be the, the real audience for his messages. He's not trying to talk to lawmakers, really amp up the pressure on them, because he doesn't have a whole lot of leverage over them right now. And that's the challenge that he is facing as the shutdown uh, continues into yet another week. And meanwhile, Zeke, your colleagues here at the AP, they're reporting the Pentagon is extending the role uh, on the southern border. What more are they planning to do? We saw earlier on them laying out concertina wire, but what, what more are they planning on doing down there? Uh, uh, we're, we're reporting that they're going to be laying down more concertina wire. Uh, there'll be more uh, uh, over other stretches of the border, other uh, infrastructure and construction that, that the, uh, the military can do and support that it can provide uh, to Border Patrol, whether it be helicopter and uh, helicopter flights, uh, sort of setting up basing, um, helping feed them in some cases, transport, make, uh, re doing repairs on Border Patrol vehicles, mm -hmm. things like that. That's sort of where the, area, the, where the military can sort of skirt that fine line where they can't be used in a law enforcement enforcement capacity, but they can augment the law enforcement and sort of allow them to redirect resources to the front lines. And lastly, the Treasury Secretary uh, was going to Capitol Hill on Tuesday. He was urging senators to support President Trump's uh, decision to ease sanctions on some Russian companies. What's at stake here? What's the reaction like? 
Well, it, it, it seems to be a, a pretty resounding uh, slap in the face to the Treasury Secretary, Secretary and, the, and the Trump administration as a as a seven or eight uh, uh, Republican senators came out after that meeting with, with Secretary Mnuchin and indicated they were going to vote against uh, or vote with Democrats against the administration and uh, and uh, register their opposition to the Treasury Department uh, removing sanctions on a couple of Russian companies who were tied to a, an oligarch who's very close to Vladimir Putin. Uh, it's an indication that the, the Trump administration doesn't have a whole lot of credibility when it comes to uh, the Russia question, even within the president's own party, uh, that even though Mnuchin was laying out a, a case that he believed that based on the on, on the evidence, based on, on, on negotiations with these companies, that they were going to separate themselves from this Putin ally, um, that didn't carry a whole lot of water with Republicans in, in a Republican tr majority. That's the sort of thing that, you know, it, it is striking um, and, and, and it, you know, would be striking. It would be the number one story um, <laughs> in, in any day in Washington, but maybe not so not so much right now in the middle of a government shutdown. But it, it, it's a striking moment that really does uh, under, uh, underline sort of the administration's challenges reaching over to its own party, particularly on this one issue. Set that coffee maker to start brewing early. Zeke Miller in Washington, D.C., thank you. Thank you.